We are live with the one and only Craig Ballantyne. I was just telling Craig that I don't like a lot of people. And I don't know what that says about me as a person, but Nick and I really like Craig Ballantyne. I don't know what it is about you. Maybe it's because you just get shit done. I don't know. And I don't know what well, it I like to think that I do. That. That's correct. Yeah, you do. You definitely do. I was trying to get an idea of what to ask you this time, because we always extract so much value from our conversations with you. And I looked just across your Twitter, which I don't even think is a main platform for you. I feel like- No, I don't use them. I actually yeah. consume more on Twitter than anything. Do, yeah. Yeah. Same, same. Um, but you just have so much shit in your Twitter feed there. I was like, holy smokes. I don't even know where to start with this guy. But quick check-in. We were talking about your daughter- <clears throat> Life as a parent, are you, you know, for those of you listening who don't know, Craig is the author of multiple books. One of them is my absolute favorites. Not that the others aren't great. They are good books. But the one that's over my shoulder here, The Perfect Week Formula, is one of my all-time favorite books because you've condensed what I think is like 30 other things or 30 other books and taken the, the, the essence out of all these different productivity books and put them into one place. And it's why I absolutely love that book of yours. And of course, put you. your own, yeah, your own spin on it. It's absolutely fantastic. But I need to ask you with your daughter, who we were just talking about, who's uh, just turned one, how is life going, Craig? Are you living <laughs> the perfect life week? You better tell us that your productivity is on point and you're living the perfect week. How is it? Yeah, it, it really is. And, and absolutely. And uh, I'm working less than ever before. And, you know, it's because of boundaries. There's a lot of boundaries in my life now that I didn't have when I was, even when I was married, there was, a, there was a lot more boundaries um, around work when I got married. Uh, but when, when I was single, there was, there was hardly any boundaries around work, which is what gives you the the stress and anxiety because you can fill every waking hour with work. And I'm a big believer that when you get married, when you um, have children, it, it kind of forces you to go in one direction. Either it just becomes chaos because you have no systems or you actually build systems that make you into a far more effective person. And now um, dealing with kids getting sick and all types of emergencies can add to it or it can, again, descend into chaos. And so it's really understanding that, Hey, listen, th this is what I signed up for. I signed up, um, to be less selfish with my time. I signed up to basically devote my life to, um, raising a child and children as, as we'll soon have, I, I signed up for that. And so because I signed up for it, you know, it's like when you sign up for the army, like you don't sign up for the army thinking, Oh, it's going to be easy. I'm not going to have to, you know, it's, I'm not going to suffer in Walk any way. Like, yeah. Right. Right. No, you sign up, you sign up for things. And when you sign up for anything, whether it's a marathon or whether it's the army or whether it's getting married or whether it's having children, you, when you decide to sign up for it, that's when you need to get serious about it and, and not complain. And, and when the situations arise that will arise, then you go, okay, man, I, we just got our butts handed to us. You know, the, the first time our kid got a, a fever. Okay, great. So what do we need next time to make sure that it's not as painful uh, when the kid gets another fever? And um, our, our child doesn't spend that much time around other kids, but my friend in Toronto, you know, he pays 2,500 bucks a month for daycare and he gets basically two free illnesses with that $2,500. Oh, I'm sure. At least. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, you know, and, and any parent goes, yes, I know how this goes. Oh, you know, we either give it to the kid and it cycles through, or the kid brings it into the house and then it cycles through the family. And, you know, like, um, we went, we went to a different place in Mexico, uh, Ajijic, which is where my, um, wife's grandparents used to retire to every winter. And the climate there is incredible, but my wife got sick on some, at some point in the travel. And so that was the beginning of February. And my daughter just got over the sickness now. So, you know, you're basically, you cycle through the illness yeah. through the family yeah. in 28 days. Yeah. Yeah. I tell all my friends, I feel like there was a three-year period where someone in our household was sick and Nick used to make fun of me like, Hey, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? And I'm like, just wait, you just wait. So yeah, you guys are just entering that period. Maybe you'll dodge a little bit because there's no take daycare element. But I want to ask now that you've been in Mexico, I feel like we're three years, two, three years. Uh, it's it's uh, only, it's only 18 months. So it was oh, November it 18 of months? Okay. Yeah, November of and, 2021. Any adjustments since we've last spoke, how is life as a Canadian living down in Mexico? How, how have you adapted? You know, it's really great. A lot, you know, probably the biggest thing that I get on Instagram from friends, from viewers, from anybody is 
is it safe? So I just got it this morning. I was on a coaching call with a guy from Long Island. He's in the construction industry, pouring concrete, you know, that's his business. And we got onto the topic of me living here and he goes, you know, is it safe? You know, and that's what everybody's uh, main question. And I'll tell you this, the most unsafe I've felt living in Cancun was on my recent flight from Toronto to Cancun, where uh, it was delayed by three hours. So it's an 820 in the morning flight from Pearson. And so, I mean, I don't know what it is with grownups. As soon as they hit the airport on a flight to Cancun, they think it's, you know, they're 17 or 18 or 19 again. So the people are doing shots at eight o'clock and well, not eight o'clock at six thirty, seven o'clock in the morning. Right. Because the flight is supposed to leave at eight twenty. You give those people then three hours of delay. Shit. Yeah. So, so we get on the plane and air Canada, which I actually like, I'm not one of those people who air Canada is garbage. No, I, I like air Canada. I have flown many, many miles on air Canada. And so I like it. And um, I didn't like this flight though, because they basically had, six 19 year olds. No, this was actually, there was 300 and some people on the plane. So uh, in our area, they had like six, nine year old or 19 year olds, you know, trying to wrangle uh, all of these people who had been drinking all day. And there were two different groups of people that, that like, I literally felt unsafe because there was a, a group oh, of um, young men who it, it was actually like a large family and uh, in, including like there was grandparents, there was parents, and there was young men around 25 years old who were vaping on the plane. And, huh. and, but not only were they, they weren't like hiding vaping, they were like going up by the bathroom and they were like vaping and like showing off to their buddies at the back. And then, um, you know, my wife would call the steward, one steward yeah, flight yeah, town, yeah. whatever they are, right? They say, um, Hey, listen, that guy's up there vaping. And they would go over and they would tell the guys, you can't do that. And then as soon as the stewardess would walk away, they would vape and like behind her back, like they were school children. Yeah, and yeah, so, yeah. so I'm like, I'm like, that's annoying. It stinks. Yeah, in here, but, fun. But, yeah. but it's actually very, very dangerous because those things, uh, I don't really, I've never used one of those things, but apparently they can be a fire hazard. So, so you're up in the air with a bunch of these dough heads, as my uh, father would have called them, <laughs> dough heads, uh, vaping on a plane. And then there was another group of people like close to my age who were who had brought their own alcohol from duty free. Oh, shit. It, and they got their kids. So they got like all these yeah, five yeah. year olds running around. And it was it was the most unsafe that I've felt in Cancun, but it was on the flight to Why? Cancun from Toronto. That's, with That's so interesting what you're saying. Why do I didn't intend to talk to you about this. Why do people, the adults, even those young adults, but adults in general, what is that? Is that just in life there? Well, I think that I have this airport theory. So, you know, cause I have, uh, I was a, a road warrior for a long time and in, you know, I was probably on eight flights uh, a month. So twice a week I was in the airport and as soon as somebody enters an airport, it's like all their discipline is, you know, they check their discipline. And huh. so like whenever I see somebody eating a hot dog in an airport and I see this all the time, I'm like, how could you possibly be eating? Like that's garbage. You're going to go on a flight. You're going to feel like garbage. Yeah. When I see, you know, especially in America, you go through and the guy, you know, guys are just getting wasted in the bar yeah. watching football on a Sunday. And all these people are wearing jerseys and stuff like that. And, and like, I'm just not a huge sports fan anymore. And I see these people just getting drunk before they have a four or five hour flight. And it's just like, everybody's common sense goes out the window on a regular day. Then you get the, Hey, we're going to Cancun, super excited. And again, you start drinking at eight in the morning, you making bad choices all day long. So so that was that was not great. We've been on normal flights from Toronto where everyone behaves sure. themselves. But, but that is but that interesting. That, that that's the when I talk about Mexico, that's your biggest memory or biggest thing that stuck out to you is actually the flight from Pearson. Listen, I right. want to ask you about this. I think you might have this pinned to the top of your Twitter. I'm not sure. Um, but it must be important to you. Sure. It's a recent tweet or something that you've pinned up there. It says what is God's or the universe's plan for you? Align mm -hmm. your plan to have deeper meaning. Um, why do you think for you to tweet that out and pin it up on your Twitter, it's obviously important to you. Where is that coming from? You just see a lot of people who don't have what you think is God's or the universe's plan for them. Why, why, are, why is that so important to you? 
So this came from, uh, so there's two ways of looking at it. There's the, the advanced way of looking at it. And then there's like the person kind of trying to figure out their way in life looking for it. And it came from an advanced conversation. So I have a client um, who, you know, the first time she started coaching with me was in 2009 when I was selling DVDs, right? DVDs of a business seminar that I had put on and she didn't have any money to her name. And she got her fiance at the time, who's, who's her husband now to pay for coaching with me. And she went on to, you know, she had an eight figure business at one point before her and her business partner split the business up. So she's in the Christian weight loss uh, world, which is a, a huge area. And so she's a very faith-based woman. And about 2016 or 17, after she had made more money than she ever expected to in her lifetime over and over uh, multiple times, she was like, I'm feeling very complacent. And I knew, I knew that the path to get her out of her complacency was through faith. And so I said to her, I said, Isabel, what is you know, cause she was like, you know, I don't, I don't know um, if I'm ready to go to the next level in my business. Uh, you know, she had home, she had homeschool her kids, you know, in 2016, she was homeschooling her kids. So it wasn't like she started in COVID as many people did, but she had been homeschooling her kids. So she's like, I, maybe I just want to homeschool my kids all day and, and not run this business anymore. And I said, Isabel, what is God's plan for you? And, and like her eyes became saucers and all this thing. And, and, and then the reason why that hit her in the heart so much is because obviously she had a huge, strong faith in, in God. But the reason why she got into the industry in which she did in the first place is because her, her mother died of diabetes at like 60 ish. Right. And like how in, in this, in this world should a woman uh, you know, in America die at the age of 60 because of food. Right. And it's horrible that, you know, so many people do suffer consequences of bad nutrition, but that's why she did it. And so here Isabel was like, you know, I've accomplished all this stuff. And, and she realized there's tens, if not, uh, you know, a hundred million women, just like her mom out there who are still suffering. And God's plan is for you to help those women. So that's where that uh, line came from. Now I say the universe is planned because there's a lot of people who aren't as strong faith-based or are not faith-based at all. And, and you need to like stir up the hornet's nest in their mind. And, you know, so some people like say, you know, the universe has got your back and all that sort of stuff, uh, which doesn't, but that's a whole nother conversation. But, you know, they really are those, um, you know, the universe has got my back type thing. Well, what's the universe's plan for you? Is the universe's plan for you to, to work 40 hours a week, watch 6.4, what is it? 4.4 hours of TV is the average amount of TV someone watches per day. And, oh, wow. and it's like, how is that possible? But, you know, my mom does watch a lot of TV. And so she went home at 4.30 and watched TV on and off until like 10 o'clock at night, then yeah, you can actually pick up four hours of TV. And so the average person, you know, the 40 hours a week and the four hours of TV a day and the $25,000 worth of credit card debt and, you know, never owning more, your own home. Like you sure you can live that way if you want, but that's not the universe's plan for you. You know, the universe puts you uh, here on this earth or God puts you here on this earth to serve other people, to do things and to create products or to help people with real estate investing or to write a book about how people can get more done so that they, you know, that ripple effect can go on throughout their business and their life and their families. You were maybe, you know, maybe you were put here on this earth. You know, I have a friend who has 10 kids, you know, all of this, you know, the same wife and uh, his wife is a midwife and, you know, they're, they're all homeschooled. They're all unschooled. He doesn't even like school them, school them. And he's just like, we let them do whatever they want, uh, learn about whatever they want. Like he was put here on this earth and his wife was put here on this earth to spread the message of home birth. And all like you got, when you figure that out, when you figure out what you were put here on this earth to do, whether by God or the universe mm -hmm. or fate or whatever it is, man, that's when, that's when you can unleash all the any, greatness inside any, of you. And any tips for somebody who is doing a job they know isn't their life's work to try to figure out what might be their life's work, their purpose. You know, we're all describing it with different words, but basically to yeah. me, that's like, what is your purpose in life? Like, okay, what is so, your legacy going to be? Yeah. Any tips for how to find that? I, so, I'm you on I mean, the spot I, here. I don't know if you're prepared to. I spent, that. I spent, uh, let's see, 2015, I would have been on a 40, right? 
Yes. From two, from 1975. So I spent, I spent, I worked from the age of 12, nearly every day since I've, I went into uh, work after school, almost every single day. Um, and Saturday and Sunday. So I've worked almost every day of my life since the age of 12. So from the age of 12 to, to 35, that was 23 years. I spent working in something that I was not put here on this earth to do. So I've got experience, right? And so, you know, the manual labor jobs and stuff, you got to make the money. So you get the education and go to the courses and all that sort of stuff. Um, now I knew what I sort of wanted to do. And I thought, I thought what I wanted to do was, first of all, I, um, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I want to be a strength and conditioning coach in the National Hockey League. And I think I told oh, you yeah, this. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You have yeah. mentioned it, yeah. Yeah, because Ken Dryden actually sent me a, a story where we don't want to hire oh, you. Oh, yeah. The, Toronto. Forgot, he I sent me a letter. That. It was yeah. really cool. Yeah. Um, so anyways, I thought I wanted to do that. That's cool. He told you to F off. Hey, well, listen, no, 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 he didn't. He, he didn't. He, he wrote me like a long letter. Like I, I got to meet oh, this guy cool. and like, just thank cool. him for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, other people told me no, no, thanks. But you know, this guy actually wrote me a nice long letter and said, no. And, and anyways, I thought that's what I wanted to do. It was in the right direction, but it wasn't what I wanted to do because at the end of the day, like that wouldn't have served as many people. And then, so I got in the personal training world and I started writing for men's health magazine. And I helped all these people lose weight, but I, but it still wasn't what I wanted to do, but it was hard for me to leave that because man, to sit at home and write emails and make a few short videos and make the money that I was making, uh, selling fitness on the internet was, was a, a tough teat to leave, you know? And, but I, but I was not happy and I knew what I wanted to do was to help people with what I help them with now, like to get freedom. Like I, I help them, people with time freedom and financial freedom so that they can help more people and, you know, spend more time with their kids and finally make time to get their health and all that sort of stuff. And be happy. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I don't want people to be miserable. And I think the reason why I do this is a couple of reasons. Um, one, I hated seeing people miserable when I was a kid, uh, you know, like the people that sit around, like my first job, I sat around the table on break and at lunch with people who commiserated about how they didn't have money, mm -hmm. how they were overweight and all this stuff. And even as like a 14 year old boy sitting there, I was like, you realize like all these problems are easy to solve, right? Like I've been, I probably have more money in the bank mm -hmm. and I make $2 and 85 cents an hour than you do. And you're a full, you're an adult and you're overweight and well, look at what you're eating. Okay. And so you always had this in you that you were going to solve people's problems or help I them did. solve their problems. I did. And I mm -hmm. don't know why I like, yeah. I am irrationally interested in solving people's problems who will forever remain a stranger to me. So that course corrected you to get to the point where you're doing what you do today with all. Yeah. The so I, I, so I just kept on going and, and figuring out and making these moves and trying new things. Mm -hmm. And like, like, for example, like I, I sold the fitness stuff from 2000 to 2015, but in 2007, I started my first you know, showing other people how to do it sort of thing. Right. It's like you guys investing in, in houses and eventually you're like, we're going to start showing people how to do it. But I didn't do full time showing people how to be more productive and stuff until 2015. So there was a lot of baby steps. And one of my mentors calls it being a reluctant entrepreneur, you know, you're not, you know, risking everything. So it was, it was slow and steady to get to the point where, you know, I do what I want to do, but you know, someone right now, you know, if you are, you know, so, you know, you're in Tom and Nick's world and you're investing in real estate, but you, you know, you work downtown and, or, you know, you, you ride the go train, you know, three hours a day and you're like, man, there's gotta be something else. Yeah, there is. And you, you, you need to start that something else today. It, it doesn't. And, and I don't mean like, okay, I'm going to go in and hand in my resignation. No, you're not going to do that. What you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, I'm going to sign up for this course. So the thing you do today is you sign up for the weekend course, or the thing you do today is you go, you know, I'm on this email list about copywriting and, you know, I should buy this course, you know, buy the course today, sit down and start watching it today. And whatever it is, you start today. Now you don't, obviously you don't fix the problem today, but you start the thing today. And then the last, like for me, I'm, I, I haven't learned this much stuff um, I'm a first, I have first timer in so much stuff in the last 12 months. 
um, since university, like, you know, in university you go and take, I don't know, I don't know how many classes you'd have in a day. Like maybe, let's say you had in a heavy day, you had four classes and they were an hour and a half long or whatever. I can't remember what they were. Right. Um, right now, you know, so I started Jiu -jitsu, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. I started Spanish and I became a father all in the same year. So this heavy learning curve. Right. And, you know, I just came back from a class now, uh, you know, felt like an idiot, you know, in front of, grown men my age trying to figure out which hand to hold as you reach your hand underneath, you know, <laughs> you just feel like a total tool. Um, and, and I think that stops a lot of people because you will have to be a beginner for a while if you want to change something, but whatever it is, you need to become a beginner today. And you, and I really, really try and like, Lo like love the feeling of being an idiot, which is very hard to me, far hard for me because I've always had like an ego that gets in my way of things, but I'm really trying hard to like, listen, the, the stupider I am and the more questions I ask, the more I'm going to learn and the faster I'm going to learn. So whatever it is, somebody wants to, you know, if you want to, you know, have spend more time in your church, or if you want to, you know, you want to write a children's book, whatever it is, right. You know, you've had this burning desire inside of you. You have to start now because every single day that you wait, it becomes harder because the momentum or the, the, the inertia gets greater every single day. As you get older, you fall into complacency and all this sort of stuff. But I mean, at 48, I consider myself so young. It's, it's like, I, I'm just young at heart and uh, physically young and health and I'm young and healthy. And I, so I believe at like 48, I got like three or four more careers and all this sort of stuff. And so it doesn't matter, but it doesn't matter if you're 60 or 65 or 70 or 75. I mean, you can always start doing things and getting better. So first of all, you have to do that. Now there's another step back of that is most people are like, I don't even know what that is. And, and it's, that's it's the tough. vast, the vast majority. Yeah. And so one of the things that you can do, it's not going to solve all of the problems, but one of the things that you can do, and this, this brings up its own problem because people will say, well, I don't know anybody who's, who I can ask, but, um, Yannick Silver told me, you know, Yannick or know of Yannick Silver. Mm -hmm. I was in his mastermind group and he said, you know, one of the things that you should do is you should go and ask all these, you know, people that you respect, you know, what do they respect and admire about you? And what do they think that you're really great at? Or maybe it was Dan Sullivan who, mm -hmm. who said that. Yeah, I've heard one that of these kind of guys before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So, so what is it that you're really great at? Because most people have heard of the imposter syndrome. You know, the imposter syndrome is people are doing things and they feel like an imposter. And you know what? The, you know, most people will feel like that. But actually, there's something that I believe um, that hardly anybody ever talks about. It's the expert syndrome. And the expert syndrome is where you know so much. Like, for example, about personal training, for me, personal training sure. or writing or productivity, like I know so much that I assume a level of knowledge in almost anybody I talk to. And, and I mm -hmm. feel like, why would you, why would you need to pay me for this? This is so obvious, but <laughs> totally. It, <laughs> yes. Right. And so you yes. probably feel that way about real oh, estate geez, all the time about real estate all the time. Right? Yeah, yeah. And, and so you, so you need to look at where you, you are uh, suffering from expert syndrome where it's like, why would like, this is so obviously easy. Mm -hmm. And that's what, <laughs> that's where there'll be some clues because if you can, um, if that's a good can, way to look at it, you're right. If you think you're really knowledgeable at that, that nobody would pay you for that type of knowledge, it likely means you're an expert at that. And it's something right, you should you're like, everybody should know this. Like, where yeah. do you feel like everybody should know what you know? And mm. that, that should give you a clue. Like these are all just clues. There's a clue from that exercise before There's a clue from this. Um, and then there's a clue from, you know, the classic, uh, athlete who would say, I know I would, I would play this game for free. What would you do for free? Mm -hmm. What would you do? Um, so for example, for me in 2010, I was writing an email. Uh, I just started like a side business. I was writing an email almost every single day to an email list about how to make money on the internet. And I wasn't monetizing in any way. Um, and I tried multiple times to stop doing it. I wasn't making any money. Mm -hmm. but I couldn't stop doing it. 
that is a huge clue that you are on the right path to doing something. Now, if you know, playing video games, like you can't stop playing video. No, that's not going to be very helpful. Right. But it's, so it's what is valuable. Unless you could monetize those video. Games, right. You know, yeah. And now you can, yeah. now, you, now, now the there is can. a little bit, maybe of an angle, but I hear what you're saying. I understand. Right. So, yeah. so it's, what is that thing that you're really good at that you just think everybody should understand? Okay. That's really that good. Uh, so I want, I'm curious about you. So that's really good for finding something. I've never really you described it that way. I like that a lot to find your purpose is like, what would you do or what would you think people would never talk to you about it because it's so easy. That's almost a clue that you're really an expert at something. But yeah. on, when you brought up um, the imposter syndrome earlier, how did you personally overcome coaching people? Because you probably had a bit of an imposter syndrome yourself saying, well, who am I to tell people what they should do in life? Like most people need to be anointed in some capacity. Like, yes, Craig Ballantyne, you are, you are the one that is allowed to share this knowledge. You know, I, I know working with a lot of people, they want, they're taking a diploma or they're taking something so they could put a little designation on their business card after their name to prove they're worthy to share whatever it is they want to talk about it. And a lot of the yeah. times you don't need that. You just need to have the self-confidence that you are good enough to share your knowledge. Did you ever battle with that? Did you struggle with that? Or is that something that you did not struggle with? A little bit, but, you know, first of all, first, you know, with the coaching thing, like, um, you know, somebody knows nothing if they are a certified coach. Yeah. So that's like the paradox, that. right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's right. All the good coaches have no certification because yeah. um, it's just real world. But, but my, I've always kind of thought that I know what I'm talking about. So I have a bit of a, you know, inflated ego and, and I'm a very opinionated person. So self, self-confidence wasn't an issue. Yeah, self <laughs> but it was in the personal training space. So okay. when I was selling, I, I probably had it the most around selling fitness stuff because I mean, I was in good shape and there was a couple of years towards the end of my fitness stuff where I was like, yeah, I could probably be, you know, if I, if I wasn't so darn ugly, I could have been on cover of men's health. Right. Um, uh, so I was, but there was always somebody bigger, stronger, more muscles, easier must, you know, easier to get muscles and that sort of stuff. And so when I was creating my programs and again, it was an expert syndrome side of things. I was like, man, these programs are so simple and they're very effective They're but they were very simple. Like why would, you know, it's like, I, maybe I need something more fancy or something Got like it. that. So I yeah, struggled yeah. a little bit at first with that, but the beauty of what I provided people was that it was so simple because, um, just like when you're starting real estate investing, when you are starting jujitsu, sure. when you are starting spending, like it, it, the, the problem becomes, you know, in your mind, it is so insurmountable that you don't even want to start. And then, you know, you along comes some person who gives you a complex program and it just makes it worse. So the, the genius is in the simplicity of things, but you know, I only see that in hindsight. And back at the start, I was like, man, is this really, cause I knew a lot of smart people yeah. and yeah. I knew, a lot, you know, I knew smart people who were on the cover of men's health magazine. And, and I was like, who am I to compete against those guys? So at first I was, that was probably where I struggled. Um, and a, a little bit when I speak to some folks who are really accomplished in business. So I just started working with a woman, you know, she's doing nearly $20 million a year with weight loss clinics. And she had been coaching with one of my friends who charges way more than I do. And she was like, you know, I want to start working with you. And I was like, I get a little anxiety around that, but then I'm, but then I have my, I have my system that I fall back. So so uh, what's the, what's the saying about um, uh, you don't rise to the level of ex of your expectations you rise to the level of your training right that's that's sure, yeah. uh, I think that's yeah. a warrior phrase which also is very good for sports right and so so in my business I don't it's not about my level of expectation it's about the systems that I've created which will then give people results mm -hmm. so it, it doesn't matter whether or not I think I can help them the system is built so that it can help anybody. Sure. So it will yeah. help them. That's so, interesting that that's how you justified 
or kind of quelled that concern for you? Because I would looking at you think, oh my gosh, like, you know, so much things on just personal productivity and discipline and kind of the mental side of performance <laughs> that it doesn't matter what, what gross revenues she's earning, you can help her. But I can see how in your own mind, it could be a bit of a battle. I, from the outside, I it just, have... it's obvious that you could. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And that's, that's another thing that we'll, we'll talk about in one second, but for me, it, um, as an introvert, I probably doubt myself the most when I come up and help strong personalities. Hmm. And so when somebody, when, when I don't know somebody, hmm. like, I'll be honest with you for my jujitsu, the hardest part of jujitsu is me going to a session with strangers I just hate it. I just absolutely hate meeting new people. I, um, you know, I get social, I still get so much social anxiety about it. I mean, I still go, I just, I just like, yeah, you know, yeah, it's going to be fine. Um, but I still I'm similar. get it. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, unless I'm in that position of strength, if I'm in a position of strength where it's my event and I'm speaking on stage, I can walk into any room. So, so when I'm low on the totem pole, and I walk in and it's like, okay, here's an hour of me looking like an idiot in front of other people. Yeah. You know, that's just human nature that most people are not comfortable with it. So back to, um, uh, man, there was something I was going to say. I, I was forgot. Say, we'll come back to it. Yeah. 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 You know, but, it, but it's, you know, it's that person who maybe this will help jar our memories, but you know, it was, it's when I get on that call with somebody who doesn't know me very well and has a very strong personality that I get that, you know, sliver of doubt in my mind. Um, but then again, I go, Oh, it's the outside eyes. I, I then think of all the people who are more successful than this person who tell me that I have helped them very much and who have said to me, you can help this person. And therefore I go, I mean, it's almost like a little bit of dissociation, I suppose. Like I go, okay, yeah. just act like the person they think you are. <laughs> and, and you go in, it's like, okay, so, all right, you get your mind right for a call and you go, and maybe it's like, you know, for anybody listening in real estate, you know, you're going in and you're going against some pit bull lawyer and some negotiate negotiation or whatever. It's like, you just get your mind ready. You go, so I'm just I'm like, remember back in Saturday Night Live, Stuart Smalley. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm good I'm, enough. I'm, I'm good uh, enough. Yeah. I'm smart <laughs> enough. People yeah, love yeah. me, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not exactly that, but you go like, listen, listen. Here are the books. Here, this. Here are a couple of testimonials. Maybe I'll read. All right, I've got my mind right. I'm going in there and kicking butt and taking names, right? And so a little bit of that from once in a while, but it's that the concept of outside eyes. That, uh, you know, the, this is a really good, um, cliche that I saw on social media years ago, you know, be, you know, be the person your dog thinks you are. Right. Have you ever seen that one? Yeah. 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 It's like, okay. My dog you know, thinks I'm the greatest I, thing. It's well. funny. So, yeah. when you say outside eyes is really helpful. When Nick and I started this business, you were giving me a flat, making me have a flashback here. I remember we had one particular investor that we were working with. And at this time we had already done like hundreds of properties with investors. And this one particular investor was really struggling to complete this investment that they were working with us with. And I was taking it very personally, but they weren't listening to anything we told them to do, but I was still taking it personally. Like they were doing everything. We would explain like, Hey, here's where you're going wrong. You have to do this. They would not do what we were, what we were sharing, but I still took it very personally because we were working with them. So, you know, and I remember going to this one conference and, uh, I went up to somebody who I'd respected at the time and I explained the situation. And she told me, she said, you're never going to save the world. You're not going to save the world as long as you are acting with the proper intentions and you know what you're giving has a proven track record. Some people are just not going to listen to you and it's not your fault. And for some reason, just hearing that from the, an outside observer who I had given authority to, to kind of to your point, it just like the weight came off my shoulders. And I thought, oh my gosh, like I can help people. This does work. But at the time when we were really young in the business still, and that was happening, I just took that stuff so personally. So yeah, you, you constantly, I think in life and in business, you need a coach like yourself, Craig, or you need to be parts of groups that are going to support you. You kind of need that when you're out on your own as an entrepreneur, it's a very lonely place. 
It's very Absolutely. lonely and your mind can just play tricks on you. So, yeah. You're on lonely entrepreneur Island is what I say. And it's like, you know, the conversations you have are with your brother-in-law or you're with your golfing buddies who, who are those who are closer to the you know normal, even if they make a lot of money, but they, they work for somebody and they don't understand what it's they like. Don't understand. Yeah. I, I want, okay. I want to ask you something else. You, you commented here uh, before in one of your tweets about the difference between saving energy and scaling energy. What did you mean about saving energy versus scaling energy? Well, it comes back to like the, use the analogy of personal finances. So like nobody saves them themselves rich, right? Like all the people that you I used know, to thought you could, I thought you could at one point in my life. And then I realized, yeah, tear that strategy up and throw it in the garbage. No, yeah. Anyway, right, sorry, no, I don't want to throw you, you off track. You, you can only cut so far. And, um, when you, when you focus on cutting, right, then, then you get into a scarcity mindset because you don't focus on expansion at all because right. Again, if you look at your head, like a, a computer, you have a hundred, you know, you only have certain, uh, computer processing units, right? And so if you put hundred percent of your CPU energy and effort into running programs that are about saving money, then you have no programs running to expand your money. And this was from a conversation I had with a client. He's a you know, young and successful guy, lives in Dubai, and he gets, he really gets into his own head and he's his, he's his own, own worst enemy. And he was, he was talking to me like, Hey, do you like, you know, what kind of personal budget and stuff do you run? And like, this is a kind of a, like a, a weird question out of the blue because the week before we were talking about how to get more high ticket coaching clients and all these like really expansion type things. I said, well, like I understand what I spend every month, but I don't obsess about it. And then this was a conversation I've had with many people many times over. And it was just that phrase that, you know, he wants to scale his business. That's, that's what he does is he helps other fitness professionals, you know, quote unquote, scale their business. And now here we are, and you want to have a conversation about saving you and you're like you're you had one one bad week of sales you hit the panic button and now it's about i gotta save money no no no. we're not going down that route i'm not gonna let you take that path because you know the the race to the bottom nobody wins you know, it's like if you take it well first of all take a look at the richest people in the world you know the waltons used to be up there so there was an era in which getting lower prices you know, was a successful plan, but now all the richest people in the world are about scaling energy, you know, Bezos, uh, Elon, Warren, and, and, you know, the, uh, you know, Louis Vuitton guy, you know, he was the richest person in the world. Like they ain't selling dollar trinkets at Walmart. None of those guys are, they're all selling really, really expensive stuff. You know, even Warren and his companies sees candies. Their whole shtick is to raise prices consistently. And so if the richest people in the world are not, are, are the richest people in the world because they're focused on growth strategies mm -hmm. and profit margins, why the heck would I go and try and, you know, unlatte my way to wealth? You know, <laughs> like that's not, that's not the way to go. It's like the Dave Ramsey way. You know, it's, I think this is you, such a, if you got a spending point. problem, sure. You got to rein it in, but eventually you get to the point where, man, I, I, I can't go to cheesecake factory on Friday night. Cause I'm trying to save up. If you're in that situation, you're, you're the game is over. I think the way you describe it with the CPU is, is really brilliant because I talk to people who their whole lives are about cutting expenses, saving money. And I always ask them, I'm like, how much brain power are you putting towards making money? Like you're spending all this time on saving money and, and they're negotiating. They'll constantly, I think this is where sometimes I tell people, you don't have to negotiate every contract that comes in front of you to try to save 50 bucks or a hundred bucks or 3% because you're spending so much mental energy, mm -hmm. making sure you're not getting ripped off. You don't have any mental energy left to figure out how to make more money in your life. So, and see, there needs to be a balance. That's where people have no value on their time. You know, it's like, it's like you've, you've heard of, you know, you got a family member or somebody who's like, oh, um, there's a gas station across town. Yo, that, yeah. Yo, you know, yeah. It's a, it's a buck 39 it's two cents and it, cheaper. Yeah. Right. And it's like, well, it's going to take you 45 minutes to do this, to save. And, and you're going to fill your tank. And I don't know the math on it. Cause uh, you know, now I'm getting my gas and pesos. So I wouldn't even know, but okay. So maybe you save $17 in exchange for 45 minutes of your time. 
Like, okay, you're tell me you're going to stay poor for the rest of your life without telling me you're going to stay poor for the rest of your life. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I always challenge people. I'm like, you're allowed to tell me these stories. As long as you tell me the equivalent time you've spent on figuring out how to make more money, at least equivalent. So, so this is a a funny story with my, um, my mom is like a couponer. Right. And, and, you know, there's a lot of these people who put so much energy and time into couponing. It becomes their identity and stuff. So, so my mom, when my, when my sister was like, nine or 10, my mom saw this thing about like, you can get like a case of frozen lemonade, uh, for X amount of dollars, or maybe it was like, you can get nine tins of frozen lemonade. And so my mom spends all this energy concocting a scheme to (laughs) send her, my sister in to get some. And then when she comes out, my mom will go in and they'll rotate. And then I remember my mom saying, or my sister saying, and then the manager said, how many more times are you going to do this? Like they got caught <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, mom, if you would just put that time and effort into, totally. you know, and it's kind of, it's the same thing with a criminal. Like if you, if you look at, um, you know, how much energy criminals put into their enterprise, like, you just put that energy. <laughs> or here's my favorite, actually, um, those people, you go to Nashville or you go to Vegas and you see all these people like, you know, they're painted gold and then they stand there like Elvis Presley for nine or 10 hours. I'm like, if you know, look how much energy you put in to avoiding work, you hate work so much that you'll paint yourself with toxic paint and stand there all day long. When imagine you put that much mental energy into yeah. some, some way where you could make real money. Yeah. <laughs> like it's, it, you know, it's my people are so irrational. Um, why did you, you, you have this thing and it says fastest, your fastest way to productivity is, is through shut. Oh, sorry. I'm confusing two points at the end of the day, brain dump. Um, oh, yeah. yeah, actually, let me go with that one. Why is that end of the day brain dump so important to you? Okay. Yeah. It's got so many facets to it. So it's part of a three step component. So what we have found, you know, my, my uh, coaches and I were just talking about this the other day, cause I have a team of five coaches. Each of them have about 50 clients. So we talk about two, 250 plus entrepreneurs oh, wow. every week. And oh, I didn't realize you were speaking to yeah. that many. Awesome. And, and here's the thing is that so many of the problems all come back to the basics. You know, it's like a hockey team that, you know, doesn't do back checking and forechecking, checking or a hockey team that you know, doesn't put the puck into the offensive. You know, they're trying to do all this fancy stuff, right? But it's there and they're losing every game because they're not doing the basics. And one of the things that almost every single one of my coaches said on a recent coaching meeting is, listen, people aren't doing their end of day routine. So everybody thinks your morning routine starts when you wake up and whether you do meditation or workout or whatever, you know, it's all this stuff that you do in the morning. No, no, no. Your, your morning routine starts the day before and your morning routine starts the day before, just like a football team, you know, the game starts when they, when they, practice the plays and the game starts when they, they choose the first six plays that they're going to run on offense in Sunday's game. That's when the game starts. And it's the same with everybody's days. So you got to plan out today or tomorrow today. So a morning routine starts at night and the steps, and it's not necessarily at night. It's anytime after 12 o'clock, but you have enough information to start planning your day. And so the brain dump is the first step in that. And the brain dump has a lot of benefits because it it gives clarity in your mind. And, you know, if you're one of those people who lays down in bed and lays there for 45 minutes, because you have 9,000 things running through your head, the brain dump will help you fall asleep in about 10 minutes because it's simply take a scrap piece of paper and just sit there and write everything going through your head. All the errands you got to run tomorrow, all the people you got to call, all the, the work you got to do, all the you know personal stuff you want to do. And you just get it out. Like I got to pick up the kids at three. I got to get milk. I got to go to CrossFit. I got to do this. I got to listen to this podcast. I got to um, get the signature on this. I got to go to the bank and do this. Okay. If you keep that in your head, it's like, you know, your grandma's attic that is full of 75 years worth of stuff. And then, you know, unfortunately she passes away and you got to go clean out that attic. 
And all that stuff is in there and it's a fire hazard and there's mice and it's, you know, there was some stuff that was valuable. And now because of, um, you know, nobody gave it attention. Now it's not valuable. And it's the same sort of stuff. If you leave all the junk in your head, it just becomes a complete mess. It causes you anxiety and stress. Like we need a release. We need that release valve and outlet. So the brain dump just gets it out of your head. That's it's interesting. Like, and one of your coaches said that a lot of people were not doing that. No, that all my coaches, all my coaches said, because here's the thing is we teach people to do this in the afternoon, but what does everybody's afternoon look like? Well, everybody's afternoon looks like three fires and a vomiting kid who's got to get picked. at that point. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. and, and so they have it on the schedule like every day at four o'clock. I want to do this brain dump. And, and then after you do your brain dump, you got, you know, you got 23 things on the list. Well, now you, the, the second step is priority to-do list. So 23 things, one of them's got to be number one. One of them's got to be number seven. One of them's got to be 23. We're going to go through and we're going to rank them. And in the morning, the next morning, what we're going to do is we're going to start working on the number one, most important. Mm -hmm. And that's how you figure out your morning routine for productivity. And people weren't doing this because, you know, something if, if they're doing it, at four o'clock or five o'clock, they're already behind because they yeah. didn't do it the day before. Mm -hmm. So the morning wasn't very productive. And then all this new stuff came in and now it's five 15. And they said they were going to have, you know, pick up the Chick-fil-A by five o'clock and be home for five 30. And they're already late. So they don't do it. And it's this vicious cycle that you get into. If you don't do it, you become more, uh, unproductive tomorrow, you get more stressed, more reactive. You don't do it, which means you wake up late and you don't do it. You get more stressed. You don't do it. And you've got to break that cycle. And so we have to go back to basics with this. You know, Dan Kennedy, who you and I have followed for a long time, talks about Vince Lombardi all the time. Vince Lombardi and the Green Bay Packers won. I don't know how many Super Bowls. And apparently all they did was run one play, the power sweep. So all Vince Lombardi did at practice was practice the power sweep. So I have no idea how boring this would have been, but all they did was one thing and they won Super Bowls because of it. And all these people who are not productive or they're stressed or whatever, they're like, they're looking for the next cold plunge, right? They're like, oh, this guy does cold plunge and, you know, this person does CrossFit and then, you know, I got to add this thing over here. No, you don't need to do any of that. You need to like cut back on a whole bunch of stuff and make sure that you plan tomorrow tonight. So every day before I go to bed is tomorrow planned. Yes. Okay. Then I can go to bed is tomorrow planned. No. Okay. Then I got to plan tomorrow because if, if you look at anything that you appreciate in life, it is not, nobody wings it, right? Your yeah. favorite movie. It's not like, man, man, they just got up there and just made up the lines. Cause they didn't, you know, they didn't study the script. It was an amazing movie. No, that's not how it works. They study the script and then they go in and they film the scenes exactly following the instructions. Uh, you know, your favorite sports team runs the plays that they practiced over and over and over again. And the team that wins is the one that practiced the plays as well as possible. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, your favorite song is, is like, you know, you right. go to, this a, is such a big point. I can't right. just hearing you. This is like game changing stuff, but it's so it's simple. Just, it's so simple. Um, and then on top of that, can you talk about like, why do you think the power of subtraction is so important? That is what I was asking you first. And I reversed the order of these questions, but yeah. the brain dump, and then you've alluded to it here. What's the big deal with the subtraction? Just that you're not, um, you don't just don't have too much on your plate. You're just handling less. Like what, what's the value of subtraction? Right. So my dad was an alcoholic. He drank, he must've drank 12 beers a day for 30 years, every single day. Oh, Wow. You know, and, and he, he was never open to change, but you know, you could have put all these things into his life. You could have said, okay, you're going to go to this meeting. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. You know, what would have been the best thing for him? Take away the beer, mm -hmm. take away the people that drank beer with him, remove him from the environments and remove the stimulus of alcohol from him, physically remove it. That is the way that you would have solved the problem the fastest. And so everybody that's not getting stuff done, if I took your phone away from you for a day, mm -hmm. you would Got become it. exponentially more productive. Not because 
you did a cold shower in the morning, not because you went to CrossFit, not because you had bulletproof coffee. No, no, no. It's because I took away the thing that steals your time. Mm-hmm. And you know, whatever it is, I mean, is whether your vice is Netflix, whether your vice is alcohol, whether your vice is gossip, whether your vice is the phone, wh- whatever your vice is, if I just took your vice away, I would make you more productive. And you know, it's the same as in college. If you, if you went to college or even in high school, if you had a paper due on March 31st, you waited until March 30th at nine o'clock to do it. Now, if you had said that, oh, wait, it's actually due March 14th, you would have got it done because you just removed all the vice and temptation. Or if you just said, hey, listen, you got to get this paper done and you put somebody in a room with pencil and paper, they get it done because there's no distractions. And so, there's, there's a lot of people out there preaching that you just need to become massively hardcore disciplined, like a Navy seal. And I understand that that can be beneficial in improving somebody's structure and discipline, especially if they're in a very bad situation. But if you want to make the fastest improvement in productivity and, and get stuff done, just remove all of the stuff that holds you back. You know, if, well, if I, you and I were going to, if you and I were going to go run a 10 K and we gave you the world's best shoes, you know, the lightest shoes in the world. And we put a 50 pound backpack on me, which one's going to have a greater impact on our 10 K time. Mm-hmm. Okay. We'll take the 50 pound backpack off me. And that's going to make the biggest improvement, not giving you the world's greatest lightweight shoes. So it is, it is the negatives and, and going back to the outside eyes, every person who is a parent who's frustrated with their kids, what's the one thing that you would do that if you could, you know, snap your fingers or wave a magic wand, what is it that you would do to help your kids be better? And it would be a removal of something. It would, I would, Mm -hmm. I would just get them to stop playing video games. I would get them to stop hanging around that kid from down the street. Who's bad. And it's, it's a removal every single time he, he just yeah. drinks too much Coca-Cola. It's a removal every single time. And it's so easy when you are the outside eyes to see the problems in other people that were, are just going to be solved by removal. When I Every, you about- everything is so easy yeah. to fix. If you remove something, especially now, maybe it's just my age or something now reflecting back. I'm like, wow, these yeah. things are so simple and so powerful because if, if I look at when this business started with no momentum and now how much leverage I personally have and how many people are able to help me in my life, it all started from probably, this is going to maybe sound scary to some people, but maybe five years of just doing what you said every morning, every morning, yeah. every morning. And it started from zero momentum. But now yeah. when I look around my personal life, I'm all the fruits of that labor are still coming to fruition today. Yeah. Like everything that's happening to me today is all from maybe that five-year window where I just said, but like, just, I'm going to focus and I'm going to do this day in and day out every morning for years. Yeah. And now it's years and years later, and I'm still reaping the rewards of that. And I'm probably less discipline than I was during that time, but the momentum and the energy of this business needed that focus to start. You know, there was Mm -hmm. nothing there. There was no, no business to be had. And um, anyway, you're just making me reflect on this, which is really cool. I I love this. What you said, Um, why is being five minutes late? So bad to your psyche. Can you talk about that? Like why is being five minutes late to something uh, this obviously has bigger meaning. Can you explain what you're talking about there? Yeah. So, so hopefully people have seen pictures of these memes where you have a tiny little domino and then, you, you know, beside that you have a bigger domino. And then beside that you have a bigger domino and like about five dominoes down, you have a domino that's, you know, smaller than a regular domino knocking down a door because each one provides more momentum, uh, and the five minutes late in the morning is a negative domino. So, so the whole thing that I was saying is if you wake up, if you wake up late every day, essentially it's a domino that tells your brain that you're a failure. And if you fail, the first thing you do in the morning is fail by hitting snooze and not getting up on time. 
what does that tell you? Like, now I'm going to sit down to breakfast. Oh, I'm going to screw this up too. And then, you know, I'm going to be late for this. And I'm going to be, late. and so if you are constantly telling, uh, being late, whether it's by being late for meetings or whether it is, you know, snoozing in the morning and being, you know, being late for getting out of bed, you are telling yourself that you're a loser from minute number one. And if it, and that's a, that's a small domino, but that domino is then the reason why somebody's 40 pounds overweight because they don't believe in themselves to stick to a diet. They don't believe in themselves to stick to an exercise. I think program. so. Eh? So you you believe that strongly in that concept. I do because listen, I don't, I don't believe this phrase, but a lot of people like to say it, how you do anything is how you do everything. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah. We could argue that all day long, but if, if you're going to make a prom, so, I mean, you're breaking a promise to yourself. Like you set your alarm for six o'clock in the morning. That's a promise to yourself that you're going to get up at six o'clock in the morning. And if you then hit snooze on that and you do not get out of bed at six o'clock in the morning, do you, do you fully trust yourself? Do you fully believe in yourself? How can you fully believe in yourself? If you lie to yourself first thing, the very first thing you do in the morning before you get up and brush your teeth or pee is you lie to yourself. I mean, Th those conversations you have in the morning at those moments are so important. I remember like, when I first started going yeah. to the gym and I was getting up at five to get to the 6am class. And I remember getting like, just popping out of bed and then just negotiating with myself. Like, wow, it's really cold outside. Like I, I, like, I should probably just go back. <laughs> you have that internal battle. Yeah. Oh my gosh. But you do. Well, that's my good. social anxiety with the jujitsu. Okay. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't have the battle of I'm going to go. And I, I just like, I hate this, yeah. and, but I'm yeah. going and, and I'm going to go. And so, um, but it's, but it's not an option. It's yeah. not an option. And you know, the thing is the more I tell these stories on stuff like this, the, the more I am yeah. committed the, because yeah. like, you know, now I don't want to be a hypocrite Accountability. of anybody, you know, if I ever stand on stage again in front of your Correct. people what, and, and know inside that, uh, you know, I told them that, but oh, I'm going to do exactly what I say I do. I always appreciate our chats and I want to keep us on schedule here. So where, uh, what are you up to? Where are the coaching? Where can people find you on Instagram, your book? Instagram is at real Craig Ballantyne. Um, I don't have any new books out. I'm working on one right now, uh, but I'm working, I'm doing a series of like virtual events and stuff like that. Uh, man, I wish I could say I was going to be on stage at one of your events, but I don't know if the timing no, is going to okay. work. Hey, you hate us. It's totally fine. No, uh, that's, right. that's totally fine. We get it. Well, hey, Craig, uh, listen, as I said to, to you, you got, it's your fault no, you've for not doing them your, down here. In no, Cancun. you've changed your life schedule to make sure you're not in town when we're doing them. I get it. I get it. So right. we're, I, I'm going to send you, I'm going to share more dates for you. Actually, I think you already told me that it's, those new dates aren't going to work. So no, there you go. You haven't, I won't be back that. until December. Yeah, there. See, you haven't even seen the dates. You're already dismissing us. That's fine. Well, I'm just waiting for the Cancun uh, Rockstar Investing <laughs> event to pop yeah. up. Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah, we have to do it. Um, Craig, thanks for this. I, I always appreciate it. I know how busy you are, or I shouldn't say how busy you are, how well you manage your time. So I appreciate you kind of slicing a little bit of your time away for us. Thank you so much. Always enjoy it. Yeah. Awesome, Craig. Thank you. Hey, thanks for tuning in. You can find every new episode of the Your Life, Your Term show on all the major streaming platforms. So Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. And if you'd like to get free copies of some of the books that we've put together, like these right here, or some of the reports that we've put together, like these right here, you can find all of those at www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's www.rockstarinnercircle.com. That's it for now. Until next time, Your Life, Your Terms.